with us a special welcome. Our Lenten soup suppers have started. Our next one is next Wednesday. Uh, it says here that there'll be a sign-up sheet at the table by the entrance. That doesn't exist. 
I'll send an email around just like last week. We had all kinds of food, great conversation. So if you'd like to join us, that'll be Wednesday at six o'clock here at the back of the social hall. We'll do that for two more weeks. Then we have a community dinner. And at that point then we are into Holy Week, which is hard to believe. I hope you all have your Christmas trees down. <laughs> I saw a little news item about a year ago that across the street at the Volunteers of America campus right here on Lake Avenue, they have installed, they've created a new vertical farm. A vertical farm. I have no idea how that would work. But using the wonders of modern technology, they are making all sorts of greens arugula and spinach and herbs of every kind and lettuce and the website looks very cool but I want to see what actually happens inside so I have set up a tour for us they're going to show us the vertical garden if you would like to come with us uh, please let me know by March 28th which is maybe what three weeks from now I don't know time is a vortex I don't know. <laughs> Let me know so I can be organized. It's going to be during the week of spring break when most of our children and youth are on vacation. It'll be Friday afternoon of that week. Okay, so let me know if you're interested in seeing the vertical farm. Very cool. Thank you for arranging that. that. Mino, we're still collecting through this month um, dish detergent. There is a bucket slash pink basket thing. Uh, at the back, so any donations can be placed in there. And we thank you so far for your incredible generosity. One last announcement. We are working on getting name tags for people. It's the best way for us to be able to know one another and also preferred names. Uh, so here is the sign-up sheet. Now, on the top it says, please write clearly. <laughs> if you don't write clearly, we make things up. <laughs> and I make no guarantees on correctness. Uh, this is the easiest way because all of our directories may have different names. Uh, Chuck? Can we use a visible link? <laughs> there is a pen that I've attached for questions just like that. So we'll be passing that around. Uh, please uh, put your name on there. And also, uh, Becca has ordered for us preferred pronoun stickers. So once we get those for you, uh, you're certainly welcome to attach that to the, oh, Becca has stickers, and so she'll be giving those out after the fact. And so this is just a way for us to recognize one another in all of our humanity. So we thank you, Becca, for taking that on, and for the kids who were passing them out beforehand, as well as everybody for writing very clearly. Um, it's a whole lot easier than saying that person over there. Uh, it also helps us when we need it to kind of jog our memory, which is certainly the case for me, and it may be for others. Am I missing any other announcements? Sandy, do you, are you supposed to say something so that you can check the box that you said something here? <laughs> Sandy's our executive minister and also a member of LABC, uh, ABC RGR executive minister. She's often gallivanting around the country because our region is from coast to coast and from border to border. Uh, and so she mentioned she was going to be here today, and uh, we'll get to that a little bit later. But if you want to just say something on behalf of RGR, you're welcome to do that. I'm assuming since you're standing here, you have something to say. Well, also, I thought I could update about Cameron a little bit. Yeah, that'd be great. Okay, go for it. Becca, could you send that to the region, the yes. microphone, farm? Because we have a creation collaborative that I would love to send that to. Oh, Thank I'm you. on that. Yes, you are, <laughs> sir. We should do that. We should do that. Um, good morning, and I bring you greetings from the region, of course, and I love coming to Lake Avenue, but I have to actually put it on my calendar to be able to get here, so I emailed Michael earlier this week to say I'm making my official visit so I can come to my home church. Um, one of the things I also do is I am chair of the board at Cameron Community at the moment. And so I thought it might be not a bad idea to give you a quick update about what's going on with that situation and their fiduciary. For anyone who might not have heard, hard to imagine at this point, um, Cameron was part of an organization of I think about 14 community organizations 
that had all come together as a single entity in order to receive some COVID-related funds. Um, the county which received those funds had them name a fiduciary in order to be the organization to receive those funds and disperse them to all 14 of those organizations. The um, county vetted the fiduciary, okay? So it was not the organizations themselves, the county vetted the fiduciary. Unfortunately, that fiduciary, um, at best, mismanaged the funds. And so, these 14 organizations, several of them, they only received a little bit of what they were supposed to get. And what's worse is the way the grant was set up, you had to spend the money first and then submit for reimbursement. Okay? So, Cameron, which um, again, for those of you who don't know, Cameron Community was founded in 1984 by this region and the Genesee Valley Presbytery. Okay, it was a joint project. And so uh, we continue our relationship, obviously, and the executive minister of RGR has a seat on the board, not normally the chair, but that's what happened this year. Um, I became chair and then all this happened. <laughs> so uh, we have been just blessed by both uh, Presbyterian churches and Baptist churches. As soon as both of us sent out the word, said what was going on, a lot of people have come forward, have made extra donations. Many of us are doing what the region just did. Our whole budgeted year worth of donations, we're sending all at once now to help them get through this period. So Cameron is out a certain amount of money in the tens of thousands that they had already expended in, I believe, September, October, November, that was never reimbursed. Then, as soon as this was brought to light in December, the rest of the funds got frozen. So they have still had expenditures January and February and just haven't even been able to submit for reimbursement. So they're still working through with the county and with insurance companies and all of that about how they might be able to get that funding reimbursed, but it's going to take a while. Meanwhile, there are staff salaries and there's program expenses that were dependent on that grant. So. Um, just putting that out there, if you would like to help, this would be a good time. Cameron is always a good uh, organization to support anyway. Um, note that I have just heard rumor that somebody was interviewed by Bob Longsbury this week, I'm not even sure who it was, who indicated that all of the organizations were in on this somehow. <coughs> that is so not true. And oh, by the way, these folks are all out tens of thousands of dollars. If they were in on it, they sure did a bad job. So please help make sure the correct information is out there, that it was the fiduciary's responsibility. None of the organizations, they were all doing everything they could. They were trying to raise red flags and just weren't being heard for a while, etc. cetera. Um, there is hope. We do have reason to hope that this money might come back to where it needs to be. Uh, we're just not sure, and as we all know, that can take a while. So please do hold Cameron in your prayers. Hold all of these organizations in your prayers. Um, some of them have actually had to really shut down to where they're only providing services one or two days a week. Cameron is not in that situation. Um, but if we don't get restitution fairly soon, that could happen down the road. So please hold all of them in your prayers. Hold the region in your prayers. We can always use your prayers as well. Uh, we just welcomed in a new church in February, Abundant Life Faith Center, which is downtown. Join our region. Mm -hmm. um, and at the same time, unfortunately, I can no longer say we're north to south. Our southernmost church has now left the denomination, so we only go as far south as North Carolina. But that's still pretty good, so. <laughs> so thank you all. I always love being able to be at my home church. Thank you, folks. And thank you for, um, you know, really being part of this region probably almost since its beginning. I don't see, I'm looking around for Garth, but we've been around for 1827 is when this region actually got its original start. So um, over almost 200 years of really good ministry. Thank you for all of that.
Thank you, Sandy. And and you didn't mention this, but please hold Sandy in your prayers. Uh, Chair of the Board of Cameron is a is a, a weighty responsibility at the best of times, and uh, certainly in difficult times like this. And so, and if you uh, would like to uh, make a financial contribution to Cameron, I'm sure you can talk to Sandy, and she would make sure that that gets to the right places to be able to make the difference that it certainly does in our community. We rely on Cameron a lot here at the church. Uh, we don't have a clothing house or food uh, pantry or anything like that because anything we did have, we have moved to Cameron to centralize services. So we send people to Cameron almost every week, uh, multiple times a week, and so we appreciate their continued work. And uh, thank you, Sandy, for the impromptu uh, yet appreciated words. Let's turn in our order of service for our responsive call to worship. Listen to the stars. They have no words. Listen to creation. Let us pray. Creator God, you call us from our busy lives to find knowledge and rest in this holy place. Center our spirits in your love. Open our hearts to your transforming word. For we are ready to realign our spirits, remember your words, and walk in your paths. Guide us in wisdom and truth as we seek to follow your ways. Amen. Let us sing together the opening hymn, I Sing the Mighty Power of God. The words are printed in your order of service. spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, 
his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they then believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. During Jesus' time, all the people who were coming to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover festival needed to have to perform and participate to perform the ritual to participate in the action. They needed to have a sheep, usually a lamb, or a dove. And a lot of people didn't want to travel with a sheep. I can understand that, right? They were like, you know what? It's already a lot of work. We got to get grandma, grandpa, aunties, all the babies, all the pots and pans, the tent, the camels. Let's just leave the sheep at home and buy the sheep when we get to Jerusalem. Okay, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. One last thing to carry all the way, right? It's a long trip and it's difficult. And you know, they don't have minivans like you do. It was really, it was a pain. So it was easier for them to buy the lamb or the dove when they got to Jerusalem. So having that set up right next to the temple was very convenient. The other thing is that a people were coming from all over, many lands surrounding Jerusalem. And many of those people used different kinds of money. They had different currency. So then they got to Jerusalem and they realized, wait a minute, I don't have the right kind of cash. How am I gonna buy food? How am I gonna buy my sheep? How am I gonna buy my dove? So actually, in some ways, there was a practical reason why these people were set up around the temple. But here's the big problem. And this is why Jesus was so upset. Number one, these people who were selling the lambs and the doves were being jerks. Because there's nothing wrong with doing business at a fair price. But they were taking advantage. They were charging way too much. Way too much. And that's just not fair. That's not what this is about, right? This is a holy festival. Secondly, the money changers were also doing the same thing. They were charging way too much. They weren't being fair about their business. Nothing wrong with doing business, but you gotta be fair about it. But here's the other thing. The other reason I think Jesus got so upset about what was happening is that they set up this shopping mall in the one part of the temple where the Gentiles, the non-Jewish people, were allowed to enter. This was a sacred place. This was God's house. So different sections of the building were set aside and reserved for different people. Non-Jews could only enter the outside court. And that's where they set up this shopping mall, which basically meant that there was no place for the non-Jewish people to gather. That meant that anyone who wasn't Jewish couldn't come in at all. That means that people who wanted to see Jesus, ask him questions, maybe learn something from him, or more, maybe most importantly, be healed by Jesus, couldn't get in there. We know one thing for sure about Jesus. He does not like when anyone is excluded, right? So the fact that they set up the shopping mall in the one part of the temple that would allow non-Jews, oh, that really burned his biscuits. He was really <laughs> unhappy, really unhappy. And that's why he really lost his cool in this passage. Now, I'll tell you some, something difficult about this passage. I've been thinking about this part of the Bible all week. 
some people don't like to say that Jesus lost his temper. They don't want to say that Jesus lost control because they say, no, Jesus is perfect. He had no sin. Okay, maybe, but I also think Jesus was 100% human and 100% divine. He was fully holy and fully human. And if he was fully human, to me, that means that sometimes he probably lost his temper. But we could debate all day about that. I'm not sure what the answer is. I really don't. I really don't know. Did he go too far? Did he really lose it? Well, let me tell you this. I used to work as an assistant dean of students. If Jesus did that in school, what would happen? Dabo, what would happen if Jesus did that in school? Would he be in ser face serious consequences? Yeah. yeah. Right? You know you're not allowed to do that kind of thing in school. You definitely wouldn't be allowed to do that kind of thing at home. Or in church, right? Please, not in church. Right? So, I'm not really sure exactly what to think about that part of the story. But, the one thing I do know for sure is that yet again we see Jesus does not like when anyone gets shut out because they're not Jewish, right? He was a very inclusive guy. He always wanted people to join him no matter what ethnicity or culture or language they had, the color of their skin, their gender, anything like that. The other thing that we can see in this story, Jesus took God's house very seriously because that is to him where God lived. And for Jesus, we don't take advantage of people we treat people with respect when they come to God's house. Even if they don't believe exactly the same thing that you do, you show respect to God when you show respect to the people who come to God's house. So we can debate about whether Jesus, uh, how bad a mistake Jesus made, but one of the things we can know for certain is that Jesus was trying to teach us, some, we can learn an important lesson from this. Right? We have to respect those people who come to God's house, treat them fairly and kindly, because that's one of the ways that we show respect to God. visiting with us today, your presence this morning is your offering this day.
God of love, we give thanks for the blessings that you have bestowed upon us, and we pray that you would bless these offerings to your service, the ways in which we use them here within this church community and beyond. And we pray, O oh God, that you would continue to bless the ministries to which we have been called. In your name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning. Good morning. This is a time where we share our joys and concerns for ourselves, for others, and our world. Let us pray together. Lord of our universe, we call upon you in fear and desperation. We are surrounded by violence, famine, military actions around the world. People in Gaza are starving and they're met with gunfire. Children and women around the world are fleeing from warfare. Cities are bombed and homes destroyed. Young people are fleeing from Burma where they're being constricted constricted into the army. Welfare in Ukraine continues as a stalemate. Warfare, warfare in Ukraine continues as a stalemate after two years. We weep for individuals and for thousands who tr try to find safety without shelter. We fear this warfare and violence around the world. Help us, help us, our creator and sustainer. Remind us of your message of hope and peace. Bring us out of our hopelessness and show us the hope of new life. Assure us that you have the power to protect us. Remind us the strength of love the love of a child holding our hand and depending on us, the love of neighbor to neighbor through aiding each other, the love of us all in this room as we eat lunch together, the love of Jesus, your son, who walks steadily toward new life. We hear you, Mother, Father, God, as you comfort us and fill us with courage. We hear your gentle words as we stumble carrying our heavy burdens. We hear you promise that your weakness is stronger than human strength. Thank you, Creator God, for your assurance that our pilgrimage will end in peace. Thank you, abundant God, for giving so much that there is enough for everyone. Thank you for giving God that you don't hold it against us when we are so frightened. You strengthen us. You love us. You walk with us. Thank you for your hope, love, and peace. We pray together in the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The scripture lesson, second scripture lesson today is from 1 Corinthians 1, 18 through 25. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent, I will frustrate. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased 
through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. May God add the blessings to the reading of his holy word. Amen. Let us, oh yeah, thank you. <clears throat> As you look at the title of the next hymn, you may think that Ken made a typo. He did not. Uh, you don't know, but about, we use about 16 hymnals in order to find the best wording, the most inclusive, the least archaic language. So instead of be thou my vision, it's be now my vision. And you'll notice the verses are somewhat different. You can't go on autopilot. <laughs> On this one. And uh, it's just that we're trying to get them so that they're most understandable to all people and that everybody is included. Thank you. meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Little English lesson to start things off. 
Today I'm going to talk about paradox. Now some of you I'm sure are going, well I know what that means. It's a refresher. A paradox is a statement or a proposition, a statement generally, that seems to be self-contradictory or absurd, but in reality expresses a possible truth. Now, what does that mean? Here's some examples from William Shakespeare in Hamlet. I must be cruel to be kind. And from George Orwell from Animal Farm. All animals are equal, but some are more equal than others. <laughs> in both of these situations, they seem to con contradict each other. But in reality, they do express a possible truth. Let me give you some scripture paradoxes. Might make a little more sense. From Matthew 10, verse 39. Whoever finds their life will lose it. Whoever loses their life for my sake, for God's sake, will find it. Philippians 3. But whatever gain I have, I count it as loss for the sake of Christ. Perhaps another one. Matthew 23, verse 11. The greatest among you will be your servant. The greatest will be the servant. And probably the most common, 2 Corinthians 12, verse 10. When I am weak, I am strong. All of these are called paradoxes. In our scripture today, and, and many of the scriptures we encounter during this journey through Lent, use paradoxes to help us understand who God and who Jesus are and who we are as people of faith. Keep that idea of a paradox in your mind. First, a little background on 1 Corinthians. The Apostle Paul wrote this letter to the Corinthian church in the spring of A.D. 53, 54, 55, current era after death. So after Jesus' death, sometime around 53, between 53 and 55. And it was near the end of his three-year ministry in Ephesus. Now, Corinth was a wealthy port city, but it was also steeped. It was full of pagan idolatry. And philosophy. Corinth was one of those places that benefited because of the military and the economy, because where it was located was connected to this Greek peninsula and the mainland. So for Paul, it was a very important place that he needed to stay in and develop a relationship with and to nurture the faith of the believers there. However, Paul received a report and a letter from the Corinthian church. And they explained to him that they were facing some struggle, division, immorality and idolatry, and theological confusion. And because of all these things, Corinth was divided. There was also this arrogant, powerful group of people who were trying to separate off from those who were perhaps new to the faith. So he wrote this letter so that they would become true in their dwelling place in God's spirit. And he wanted them to stay faithful to the gospel, to be, as it's said in chapter 1, verse 8, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul wanted to call on them to work together for the advancement of the gospel. He wanted them to come together and do something together that is greater than they could do themselves. He wanted to build up the believers, those who were weak, and witness effectively to the unbelievers. He wanted to strengthen that community. Now, Paul's view of theology is, we could say, top down. In the cross, God has deliberately chosen to reveal God's self and to unleash this divine power that is the goal of human salvation. Now, the irony, the paradox of this divine scheme is that the cross is the last place where humanity would ever expect to discover God's wisdom and power. It was the ultimate disgrace for someone to die upon a cross. It was a capital punishment method that was used by the Roman Empire to bring the powerful to their knees. It was reserved for those who were undisputed criminals, religious slaves, 
insurrectionists, pirates, people who had threatened the social standing of the community there. The cross was that punishment that was used for those who needed to be brought down in size. Now also keep in mind, those types of, uh, when the cross was used, crucifixion, it was used uh, to, to have other people see it and be reminded that they needed to, to stay humble and to follow or toe the line. It was that torture during and even after death because they wanted people to see what was being done and know that they should, with no, uh, no uncertain terms, not do what the people before them have done. So it's strange in some way that God would use the cross, this symbol of death and degradation, in a relationship to power and glory. In fact, Paul doesn't just suggest this, he says this, he proclaims it again and again, that the cross is the exclusive means by which God has chosen to enter into humanity and initiate this act of salvation for us, for us lowly people. The cross is the act that both embarrasses and embraces humanity all at the same time. And it's an incredibly inclusive embrace. According to chapter 1, verse 22, the Jews demanded signs, and the Greek were looking for wisdom. They went into philosophy. They wanted to see things like the Jews did in the past when God was near. They wanted these philosophical arguments that would show that God was present. The problem was, these types of proof, those which the Jews had seen in the past and those that the Greeks liked to hear about in philosophy, were limiting and expressly human. The proclamation of Christ crucified doesn't fit this type of human criteria. It offends Jewish sensibilities, and it confuses Greek or Gentile intelligence. Verse 20 shows that people who have tried to use their knowledge in various forms to get a greater sense of God fail. There is a limit to what we as humans can understand about God who is divine and who has come in human form. We can't understand God fully because God is God and we are humanity. Even the best and the brightest who have tried by human efforts to understand and explain and experience God have come up short again and again. However, for as difficult as it is to understand and explain the experience of God, the story of Easter that we're moving towards is an illustration for us about how God embraces humanity through the cross. Both Gentiles and Jews are called into a relationship with God through the work of the cross. Suddenly, that thing that seems so outwardly um, painful and degrading debilitating, becomes the source by which we experience divine revelation, power, and salvation. The paradox that fits this is that in order to be strong, one must first be weak. In order to be lifted up, one must first be brought down. In order to experience glory, one must first go through the power of loss the loss of Christ, the loss of ourselves in giving ourselves to this God who is beyond understanding. We do not get to God or find this particular key to knowing God through our own efforts. Rather, God comes to us and God establishes the terms of the relationship with us in the encounter with the cross. Paradoxes show up in Paul's writing all the time. It seems to be one of his favorite sort of uh, literary tools. Today we only see one, but we see a big one. And in order for us to journey to the cross through this Lenten season, we have to remember things that remember that things don't always make sense to us as humans, but God has something so much bigger in store. Sometimes we have to become small to become big, weak to become strong, alone, to be enveloped and embraced by community. Paradoxes are just something that part of the scriptures and part of life as Christ followers. They exist 
whether we like it or not. For Paul, the cross becomes the key to understanding not only God, but understanding ourselves as people who are called by God into something much greater than we could ever imagine. Hence, the proclamation of the word by the cross, by Paul, and contemporary people like me does not impart some new understanding of the divine. Rather, it, it gives us, me and you, I hope, a reminder of how we might experience and encounter God anew, precisely where God most clearly displayed God's self, the power and the wisdom and the love of God displayed through the cross. The cross remains at one and the same time offensive and yet delightful. Paul's preaching doesn't downplay, disguise, or dismiss the power of the cross, nor should we. God is manifest. God's love is ultimately manifest through the power of the cross. And I invite you through the rest of this Lenten season with me to journey to that and beyond that, to life, true life, in Christ. Amen. Amen. Today, we are reminded, reminded of the power of Christ. We are reminded of the power of the cross and the fact that it took Jesus in death, but Jesus transcended that into life. And we are reminded of the body and the blood of Christ poured out for the forgiveness of sins, our sins, our own wrongdoing wiped clean by the power of Jesus. This is the Lord's table. It's not our table, or the table of Lake Avenue Baptist Church, but it's God's table, and we are all welcome there. Let us sing together. The feast is ready. The words are printed in your order of service. something out as we gather together for communion today. You will see the phrase, the celebration of communion. 
Now that may seem strange to you because oftentimes we think of communion as a very uh, solemn and painful reminder. I want to remind us, though, that it is indeed a celebration, hence the tone of the song we just sang, because we look to the cross with communion. It was the last meal shared by Jesus and his disciples, indeed, yes, but it's also a reminder of why that meal was shared. We look beyond that last supper to the cross and to the resurrection, and indeed, in doing so, we are reminded that communion can and is a celebration this day. On the night that he was betrayed, the Lord took a loaf of bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it, saying, This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. We'll now distribute the bread. bread in remembrance of Christ's body broken for us. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. For as often as you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you proclaim Christ's death until he comes again. Let us share in this cup.
Let us drink of this cup in remembrance of Christ's blood poured out for the forgiveness of sins. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. We'll sing together the one verse printed in your order of service of Christ is made the sure foundation. started this um, mission, outreach mission. And then she just turned 80 yesterday, I think. Right. This is supposed to be a little bit, you know, like surprise. This lunch is actually in honor of Jane's 80th birthday uh, lunch. That is... <laughs> Many people, 
lives you know, to, you know, we just want to be like you when we get to that age. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so, you know, hopefully, you know, that we can be just like you and that we can touch many other hearts. And this is just a little something, a little love that we want to show you. And then back there, if you want to take a look at it, it is say 80. And then I, I heard, you know, I saw you brought your own cake too. So we have a special <laughs> cake for you. We have a special cake for you too. And then so um, after Pastor Christopher give you a blessing, and then I will, we would like you to hold the candle in the back. And this is just a little something that's from the community, all the love. And then I want you to accept this, Jim. Thank you. We love you. ปิปิเจจนโดเมมาลูไตตาปอมาแกกองญาติเด้อ่าบ่าผิดบ่เด้อยินิจิติกูดอกองจีปิเด้อเตชิกุยปิเด้อจมัจิกุยปิเด้อ